Thank you for the introduction. Um, this is joint work with Stefan Katzenbeiser, and as said, it's about um, practical compiler-assisted um, parallelization of secure computation. Um, in the previous talk, we have seen one of the applications of secure computation. Um, here I've got another example quite similar. We've got a, a smartphone user with a fingerprint. We've got the server with a database of fingerprints. We would like to match them. If we actually look closely at that task, we observe, well, those parties only need to learn the Boolean information, the outcome, whether there is a match or not. So we would like to do that in a privacy-preserving manner. You could either do that with, by coming up with a dedicated protocol, or you can use generic secure computation, which kind of generalizes the privacy-preserving protocols. Um, more abstract, we've got a functionality f. We've got two parties. Both have private inputs, and they want to compute the functionality. The only thing that they learn is the output of the computation, namely f of x and y. Um, the first protocol proposed for secure computation that we are still going to use in this talk is um, Yao Scarble Circuits. It was proposed in the 80s and functions um, was based on the idea to represent a circuit, uh, to represent a functionality as a circuit and instead of using Boolean values, um, random wire labels are used for each um, wire. So we have got a label representing one, we have got a label representing zero. And gates um, are not evaluated with the common techniques that we know from Boolean circuits, but instead so-called garbage use tables are used. And they basically represent the encrypted form of a truth table. So um, if you look at the Boolean truth tables and we have an input of one on the one side and an input of one on the other side, we get the output of one for the example of an AND gate. For the garbled table, we have a similar behavior. Um, if you have an input label representing one and we have another input label representing one, we would encrypt the output label representing one under these um, labels. We can do that for all entries in the table and then we can kind of encrypt a gate in the circuit. Now the full protocol then functions as follows. We've got two parties, the generating party and the evaluating party. The generating party creates these garble tables um, for all gates in the circuit, sends them over to the evaluator. Now the evaluator can't do anything right now. He still needs to get some input. Then as the first step, the generator sends its own input to the evaluator. And then the evaluator and the generator engage in an OT protocol. Described by, um, as described by Michael, and the evaluator is capable of decrypting a single path through the circuit to um, gain the result of the circuit. Um, the protocol is secure in the semi-honest setting. Um, however, there are multiple extensions to, to get more security and stronger security models. The takeaway lesson here is we are operating on circuits, and one party has to do more work than the other party. Um, that brings me to our motivation. Um, the protocol was long seen as impractical. Then in 2004, a long line of practical work on secure, com uh, on secure computation based on Yao garbage circuits started. Um, and in 2015, so this year on Eurocrypt, there was this half-gate paper which basically indicated that we have reached the lower bound on the number of cipher attacks that we need for nonlinear gates, um, which kind of is not a good insight in the sense that in the sense of whether there is room for improvement. Um, so we have that. On the other side, we see our world is getting more and more parallel. Even our smartphones nowadays have most likely at least four cores. So um, in this work, we would like to investigate whether we can speed up Yao's garbled circuit um, using a compiler-assisted approach um, when using parallelization. Um, well, when you want to do your garbled circuit in parallel, in principle, you can copy the concepts from common um, circuit computer science technologies. Um, you've got your gates. If you find independent gates, you can um, distribute these gates onto your number of available processors. Each can create those garbled tables. Um, you can send them over to the evaluator. The evaluator can then use um, any number of processors available to him and can decipher the um, gates. Um, has been shown that this has no impact on uh, the security. However, important to note is you have to synchronize your transfer. So you have either have, you need some identifiable order of your gates or you um, need to synch synchronize the transport. 
But the hard problem is how do, we, do I identify independent gates? The most naive approach or very common approach is to use gates that are on the same circuit level. Um, we refer to this approach as fine-grained polarization because if you have a level, um, all gates within this level are independent, so you can choose any granularity that you want. The only drawback of this approach is that you need a synchronization, synchronization between multiple levels. And if you have that, uh, you are really circuit on the, you are really depending on the shape of your circuit. So it would be preferable, that's the approach that we present here, um, to, de to detect larger coherent partition of gates. If we identify those, we need less synchronization and have a more efficient parallelization. Unfortunately, if you have a circuit and you want to do that, it's known as uh, this problem is known to be NP hard. So um, it adds kind of the, it adds some complexity to the problem. So um, our approach here is to already identify parallelism on the source code level and track this parallelism, parallelism throughout the um, compile process um, into the circuit. And that directly leads me to our toolchain, our compiler, parallel circuit compiler, that takes C source as input and compiles it down to parallel circuits. Here we see an example C code. Um, it's a millionaire's problem. We use the notation that was used in our compiler CVMCGC. Um, and it basically is normal CQ. The only requirement or the only change that you need is you need a special naming convention. You need to name your variables to identify parties and to identify outputs. Um, so our compiler takes such a code file as input. I mean, if you want to do parallelization, you can imagine we have a much, much larger source code file. Um, we feed this um, input to, to a framework called par for all It's using state-of-the-art parallelization techniques. And as a result, we get the C code back with some annotation where parallelism can be found um, and where we have um, only sequential implementations, sequential code. Um, we then take this information and decompose the source code file into multiple files. Um, here we see an example. We've got a sequential part. We have a parallel part. We have a sequential part. And we give these um, files to our circuit compiler, CVMGC. Um, we add some mapping information. So we need to identify what, which are inner inputs, which are outer inputs and outputs. And the uh, compiler then creates circuits based on the information created um, before. Um, here are some example applications that we compiled um, and that we are going to use for our evaluation. The first one is the biometric matching I already, that I introduced in the introduction. Um, another one is the modular exponentiation. It's used for blind RSA. And we also have, the, um, have an algebraic application, a matrix vector multiplication. Um, just some short uh, look at the numbers. The biometric application has the largest circuit. Um, the matrix vector multiplication has a really um, small circuit size. Um, the biomatch application also has the largest input complexity, and the modular exponentiation has a really low input complexity. And uh, we'll later see how that has some influence on some numbers. Um, we also implemented a framework. If you have a parallel compiler, you need also a parallel framework to evaluate the performance of your circuits. Um, therefore, we extended the just garble, garbling scheme um, such that it supports parallelization. Um, we implemented all currently known optimization techniques, and we um, used OpenMP and pthread for parallelization. Um, as the testing environment, we used Amazon um, EC2 cloud instances with 16 physical cores each. Um, they are located on two sockets, so we see some communication delay in between, and we achieve a garbling speed that is almost equivalent to the um, garbling speed of just garble. Um, let's look at the results. So um, fine-grained parallelization works for all three example applications. However, the efficiency of parallelization is far away from ideal. Um, so we see a really limited efficiency. If you look, however, at the, at the performance of a coarse-grained parallelization, we see that we achieve a speed up that is close to the ideal speed up for a smaller number of cores. Um, however, we also see a small gap when going from eight to 16 processors. As, as described earlier, we have the, those two sockets. We need to overcome that 
communication um, delay. Um, now, a question that also came up during the review was, well, you just can simply increase your input sizes. All your problems are gone. You can use private, um, you can use the fine-grained parallelization. Why don't you do just that? If you, if you are talking asymptotically, that's not a problem at all. So if you actually look at those current high-level open source compilers for secure computation, um, especially here I've got the, the printout for CBMC, as you see, what they do is they actually do not compile into circuits with, with a low width. No, with a high uh, circuit width, sorry. So the biometric, magic, biometric matching application actually has an average circuit width that is in the single digit range, even though we have a circuit with 60 million gates. Only, only the um, matrix vector multiplication circuit um, has an average width that is in the range of 1,000 nonlinear gates per level, and that's an, um, a width which leads to efficient parallelization. Um, as said, the problem is that current compilers, high-level language compilers to, that compile to circuits do not look for width. They try to minimize the number of nonlinear gates. Um, as an example for CBMC GC, we have array accesses. Those compiled to circuits with linear depth in the number of elements having a constant width. Um, the same goes for comparisons. And if you now look again at the biomatch circuit, that's an application. We have lots of array accesses. We have lots of comparisons. And that's the reason why we, even if we would increase the input size, we would still get circuits with a low, um, uh, low average circuit width. Um, now, the previous results were only the garbling. Usually, if you, if you run Yao's protocol nowadays, you want to have some online results. You want to have the, the, those parties running live. Um, at the same time, and we, we also experimented with that in a lab environment, also on the Amazon EC2 cloud. And there we have the benefit of having a 10 gigabit Ethernet connection, and then we scale on that. Um, however, we require quite a lot of bandwidth because our implementation, um, or the serial implementation of just GAB is already quite fast. And require um, a bandwidth of one gigabit per second per core Using 80-bit security, when we go to 128, we even require 1.5 gigabit. So um, the question that definitely is reasonable is, um, does it make sense to parallelize? Can we profit from parallelization, even though if we have limited communication, um, uh, limited communication link? And yes, we have an idea that gives you a little benefit, even if you have limited communication. And that's based on the following observation. If you run Yao's protocol and you look at, at it in, in, well, sorry, in, in its basic form, um, you see one party has to do much more work, four times the work than the evaluating party. If you parallelize, you still have this, um, fract uh, this um, gap. However, you have multiple cores. It would be much more preferable if you could kind of interchange the work like that, what we refer to inter-party parallelization, such that both parties have an equivalent amount of work. Assuming equ equivalent computational power, you, um, will, uh, you will observe a speed up of 1.6 or 1.33, depending whether you're using the half gate approach or not. And uh, this is also still secure in the semi honest model without any further extensions. Now, again, if I said we have a compiler, and usually we have much more complex applications that have more than, that more than purely a parallel um, fraction that also have a sequential section, as for example here. And what we like to do is to exploit this inter-party parallelization also um, within this part, even though we have a sequential part before and afterwards, or maybe even much more complex multiple parallel parts, a sequential part, and so forth. Um, so to do that, we propose to securely share the state. You could either do that using one-time pads, or you um, could use the permutation bits. Um, for details, I refer you to our paper. However, um, it's possible to exploit um, IPP even within a much more complex circuit. So we benchmark that. The first benchmark is, again, the um, highly efficient network connection, 10 gigabit. And we um, combined the cross-grain parallelization and the idea of IPP. And we observed that we 
benefit from polarization, even though it's quite little already on a single core, and we can kind of exceed the ideal speed up of um, four when using four cores. But to be honest, we are using multiple parties um, that have double the amount of CPU, so it's not a fair um, comparison with the ideal speed up. Nevertheless, we also observe that some application, like the biometric matching application, um, suffer under the idea of IPP, and that's because um, their input um, or their um, sh shared state, their shared state is um, too large, to, uh, too, too large, and takes too much time to um, share it. Um, for this benchmark, we added a sequential state before and afterwards, or sequential code before and afterwards, to really get an insight on the number. How good does IPP perform in mixed mode functionalities? If you look at a low bandwidth environment, low bandwidth in this case, um, 100 megabit, but you could still scale that down and would um, observe similar results. We observe a speed up for both applications. And that's first might seem surprising because we are already exceeding the bandwidth that we have with a single core. Um, however, we observe that speed up because we start to um, use the symmetric um, communication lines that are available. Before, we had a protocol that communicated um, unidirectional. Now we can communicate um, bidirectional. So we observe a further speed up. Um, with that, I would like to close. So we presented a tool chain that um, compiles from C code to parallel circuit. We show that we can achieve um, performance gain through that. Um, obviously, the network boundaries are reached. And currently, we are um, open working on open sourcing um, both our compiler as our framework. Unfortunately, that will still take some time. And we are also investigating how to extend the IPP approach to other STC protocols. Thank you. And I'm open to all your questions. Hi, thank you. So my question is, what, con what is like your unit of parallelism when you have coarse grain parallelism? And the reason I ask is because um, I'm wondering whether you do a pre-processing step before you issue your parallel blocks to the compiler. And by pre-processing step, the one I had in mind was like trying to pack the circuit as shallow as possible. So like in the computer hardware community, we're constantly playing this game where we're trying to get shallower circuits to meet timing better. And that seems like it would really work well in your setting because the shallower circuits, the less opportunity for interference there is between levels and fine grained parallelism might work quite well and you can just chop the circuit up. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. I'm, I'm sorry I got partly lost in that. Um, no problem. So, so the idea you, is to reduce the depth of the circuit that you want to evaluate so that there's less levels. If there's less levels, then you can just take one of the few levels that you have, chop it up, and issue it to cores. So there's more parallelism there. Yeah, I, I'm still confused by the idea. So, what's, so, so, what? so do you, my question is, do you do anything like that, or do you just take a program and kind of issue it to the parallelizing compiler and just hope for the best? Um, that's basically it. So um, yeah, we are taking the program. We do some static analysis to to push um, constant values because that's what you want to do. You you want to have your all your um, constants pushed down as far as possible. When we give give it to you the parallelization framework, and we take it back, and that's what we take as input. So with the fine grained parallelism approach, did you all think about how to change the shape of the circuit so that maybe it would work better? Do you have some, some intuition whether that's like a hopeless path or? No, 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 uh, by far not. No, that's a different topic. But yeah, definitely we're working on that. It, I mean, it makes sense for other protocols, for example, described by Michael, the GMW protocol. Um, it's just that the compiler in the current state are not optimized for that. I mean, it's easily, do and not easily, but it's definitely doable, just a different compile target. So far, it was for YAS garbled circuit. It's only necessary to push down the number of nonlinear gates. And that was well, that's what the main focus was of I all see. work. So as I said, you don't need to, if you have some array access, you don't need to unroll them. You can use some kind of tree using the same amount of circuit. It's just not, it was not a focus so far. Okay. But you can definitely do that. OK, yeah. thank you. I have an, uh, 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 maybe more, more of a comment. Uh, so so uh, 
Uh, I think what is very relevant is, so there's a line of research on parallel oblivious RAM, which was started by uh, Raphael Pass and Kaimin Chan and Gillette Boyle. And, and I think Rachel Lee and her student also has a new paper on this. So basically they show that given any RAM program, um, you, uh, if the RAM program um, to start with is parallel, uh, you can take this um, oblivious parallel RAM technique and um, convert that RAM program a parallel RAM program into like a oblivious version of the parallel RAM yep. program. Uh, so, so I think pr probably with your compiler, you don't deal with dynamic memory accesses and you like you probably compile a dynamic memory access into like a linear size circuit. But with these like uh, oblivious RAM techniques, you can kind of um, deal with these uh, dynamic memory accesses more efficiently. Yep. Um, and also if you, if you restrict to a somewhat smaller set of um, computations that you care about, let's say MapReduce computations are graph lab computations. So these are the popular programming paradigms that people use to develop uh, a large class of like data mining algorithms in practice. Uh, so we, we ha so th there are a couple of papers, like when there's a paper by uh, Goodrich and, and Mittenmacher. Uh, this was kind of hidden uh, in their paper. It, it was their ORAM paper back in uh, ICAP 2009. And they showed that give, uh, given a map reduce program, there is an um, uh, efficient and um, parallel, I mean, I guess they didn't talk about the parallel part, but it's obvious that um, uh, the oblivious algorithm they generate is, is a parallel uh, oblivious yeah. algorithm. And also you can generalize this further to things like graph lab abstractions. Like given a graph lab program, you can also have like a very efficient and um, parallel oblivious algorithm, uh, which uh, parallel oblivious algorithm is basically equivalent to saying like uh, a circuit is shallow depth and, and why. Yeah. Okay, so, so I, I just want to point out. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm aware of that work. So when we submitted that work to Usenix, the, I guess your graph SC paper, for example, was not published. So I definitely agree that um, ORAM, that uh, asymptotically ORAM based secure computation approaches are by far preferable. I totally agree to that. So there's no. Um, okay, yeah, thank you.